What's up guys? Joe Munoz, OneStepPrep.com. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about something that I talk about in many other videos already, which is the V1 cut. And this popped up because I have a great buddy of mine here in the studio with a live audience, getting ready for a instructor role at a legacy carrier. And they're gonna have him talk about the V1 cut. So why not just get on the camera and talk about V1 cuts with you all here. So with that being said, let's jump into this. And first thing I wanna know from you all down in comments below is when, if ever, have you had a V1 cut for real, in real world, not in the sim, in the real world. When has the engine failed at V1? Now, when have you had an engine failure at all? And even that in the world of jets is fairly uncommon, fortunately. Despite that, we still train V1 cut. And the reason we do is because an engine failing at V1 is by definition of the FARs, one of the most critical phases of flight. So effectively, if, for those of you that care about regulations and you wanna dive into this, if you go to 14 CFR part 25, this is the, the certification of transport category airplanes. This is where they spell out that you must have an aircraft able to take off at gross weight and still meet second segment climb with a single engine failing at the most critical point, which they define as being V1. That's the reason why we train it. Doesn't mean it'll happen frequently, but that's why. Now, with that being said, the number one most important thing on a V1 cut, in my opinion, is maintaining directional control. And really, that stems from a couple of things, but because we're talking V1 cut, and one of the beauties of the V1 cut, if there's anything beautiful about it, is the fact that at V1, I am technically still on the ground which means I have visual reference to the center line. So I'm going to share with you that you should do something that you have done since day one of flying, which is to look out the window at V1 when the engine fails. And you see, without any guesswork, which way the aircraft is yawing naturally. This is something else that I tend to see people do is they try to anticipate which engine's gonna fail. They try to add rudder to have an anticipation of which one may have failed. You don't need to anticipate, you need to do what you do every single day when you fly an airplane, which is simply look out at the window, look out the window and apply rudder to maintain directional control when you're rolling down the runway. This is what you do every day. You steer down the runway with your rudder pedals. So do the same thing on the V1 cut. When you see yourself experiencing the engine failure and the, and the jet is deviating off in either direction, just apply the appropriate rudder pressure to parallel the center line. So now we get to this point of paralleling the center line. So I want to parallel the center line because ultimately if I can parallel the center line and I can rotate off being parallel to the center line, then that tells me I have the appropriate rudder pressure to counter the natural rolling tendency that will happen once airborne. Now, that's a lot of words. It was very wordy. So let's slow that down and give you something maybe a little bit more easily digestible. When the engine fails, step one, look outside, apply the appropriate rudder, parallel the center line, smoothly, rotate off smoothly and nice and slowly. When you hear that term rotate, the pilot monitoring is not commanding you to rotate. They are simply acknowledging you have reached the speed at which rotation can occur. Now you don't want to take forever because we still have to meet second segment climb. That's a different discussion in and of itself. But the point I'm getting to is I do want to make sure that I can actually smoothly rotate off and be in good positive control of the aircraft. So now when I smoothly rotate off, there's one thing primarily, maybe a couple of them, but let's go to the one thing here that I'm looking to do, which is to ensure the wings are level, and they should be if you have proper rudder input from the ground. And the next, second mo most important thing is airspeed preservation. You've heard me say this on a bunch of videos, never go above the flight director, never go above the flight director. You hear me say never go above the flight director. What I'm really trying to say is do not sacrifice airspeed. That's what I'm trying to say. Because the problem with the V1 cut is that you have several things that are going against you. One of which is you have all this thrust that is in essence trying to roll the jet over and then you don't have a lot of airspeed. And so if I were to ask you what's one of the most important flight control surfaces when you have an engine failure, it's the rudder. Because the rudder is what allows me to maintain that directional control through the yaw axis. Now, it's great to have a rudder, but if I don't have any airspeed, the rudder's worthless. So you have to have airspeed. And this is why I say don't go above the flight director, because what I'm really trying to say is keep airspeed on your side. Now, once you have the wings level, 
and you have airspeed on your side, you can now begin to apply appropriate rudder trim inputs and later connect the autopilot. What's the deal with the wings level, Joe? The deal with the wings level is two things. Number one, obviously I don't want to flip over, but two, let's go to something that's less severe, let's, that's less dramatic, okay? I just want to be inside of ACS tolerances, Airman Certification Standard. When you go for a type rating or you go for an FAA ATP, it's going to say I got to maintain plus or minus five degrees left and right once airborne. How do I do that? By ensuring the wings are level. And the reason the wings would not be level is because you don't have the appropriate rudder pressure input, which was a problem that stemmed from back on the ground, which is why the first thing I said to do is to just look out the window. So you look out the window, you, set, you get parallel with the center line, you smoothly rotate off, you ensure the wings are level, and then you ensure airspeed is on your side. And the way you do that is pitching into the flight director, but never above the flight director. And if for some reason you can't track the flight director, then go below the flight director, but do me a favor and don't go above the flight director for the hundredth time. Just somebody do me a favor and write in comments, don't go above the flight director, okay? So once you don't go above the flight director and I connect the automation on, I put the autopilot on, if you were in a 320 at this point, you could just hang out, but if you're in a Boeing, you still gotta work because the autopilot doesn't trim the rudder on the 737, unfortunately. So you start trimming the rudder and you don't have to go crazy with the inputs. There's all kinds of things flying around in terms of how many units you need eight in climb, five in cruise, three in the descent, four all around. They come up with all kinds of, I'm gonna tell you what you need. You need to input the trim until there's no pressure on your foot. That's it, just go by feel. When you don't feel much pressure on your foot, you're in a pretty much a, a good spot with your trim. Very simple. Now, what's gonna happen next is you're gonna reach the acceleration altitude. And if VNAV happens to be on, VNAV will accelerate you automatically. And if it's not connected, then you're gonna have to bug up. You're gonna have to increase the airspeed yourself on the mode control panel. Now, when you increase the airspeed, keep something in mind. As I have more airspeed, the rudder's more effective. More airspeed, more effective rudder. Now, because the rudder's more effective, that means I don't need as much. So if you just trimmed all the way to the full range of the trim, because you're climbing at V2-ish speed, and now all of a sudden you begin accelerating, I don't need all of this trim anymore, so now you're gonna have to be prepared to start removing some of the pressure. Why? Because the rudder is more effective. This is the, the very simple illustration to show this to you, is to just go out in your car and drive at five miles an hour, stick your hand out the window, and drive at 50 miles an hour and stick your hand out the window, right? You can get your, your hand to deflect with very small input, it'll, it'll want to go flying, so to speak. If you're at a high speed and a low speed, it just won't want to. And so the point I'm getting to is the rudder is no different. It's a surface that's very much more effective with more speed. So you need a lesser deflection and that's why the rudder trim has to continuously be adjusted when one of two variables change, which is airspeed or thrust. And when we accelerate, we're only changing one of those, which is the airspeed. Later on, we'll change the thrust, but initially it's just the airspeed change. Now, how much more can we go on about this topic? Well, a, considerably amount, a considerable amount more because we haven't got into the procedure yet. We're just talking about the stick and rudder. That's the stick and rudder, get off the ground, keep it within plus or minus five degrees, so on and so forth. Eventually, you have to apply a memory item, if applicable, and later on a QRH item, right? And the memory item would apply if it's a severe damage, in the case of the 7.3, the ECAM in the case of the 320, or, uh, and, and once you do the memory item in the case of the 7.3, which is what I'll focus this around, mainly. Uh, once that memory item is complete, then I have to go to the QRH and I have to complete the quick reference handbook for engine fire, severe damage, or separation, if that is the one that happened to occur. And then once that's done, I have to do the normal checklist because I always do the memory item, one non-normal checklist followed by a normal checklist. What's the normal checklist, Joe? After takeoff, we just took off. And then I got to go into the remaining non-normals, which would be either an engine in-flight relight, if applicable, or a one engine in operative landing, if applicable. So this in and of itself, then we can go about the go around the pattern. I got to do the single engine ILS. How do I fly single engine ILS? How do I fly single engine go around? Like, oh, there's to be discussed. And I very much do, and not only do I discuss, but I also fly it in the sim and talk about it while I'm flying it. And, and you got to understand, it's when I'm in the sim talking about it and doing it, it's mainly to illustrate a couple of things. One, I want you to very much get a perspective as if you're there in the sim with me doing it, but mainly so you can gain an understanding of it's nothing that you have to be overly stressed about. As long as you have airspeed on your side, honestly, you have directional control. And if you have directional control, you can fly all day on a single engine. 
So with that being said, hopefully you found value in the video. Hopefully it made sense. You know where to find us, onestepprep.com. And if you haven't already done so, subscribe to the channel, like. Hit that little bell thing that has the notifications so that when Joe comes out with another rubber chicken video, you can see what's going on up here in the studio at One Step Prep. All right, we'll see you in the next one.